welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure to preach this morning on uh, this Sunday, this week. In 1987, I was at school and I used to travel across the city of Sheffield to, to get from home to school and back again. Having to go through the centre of the city meant that uh, one of the bus stops that I used to catch a bus from, particularly on the way home, was near a cinema. And I was 15 and I had begun to kind of explore and enjoy sometimes uh, watching a film on the way home from school. One film really caught my attention. It was directed by Richard Attenborough and it was a film called Cry Freedom. And it was set around apartheid and the struggle for justice in South Africa. The plotline focuses on a black activist, Stephen Biko, who is challenging injustice, challenging that systemic racism. And he is arrested and, and ultimately killed. And the film, the plot hinges upon his relationship with the editor of a newspaper, Donald Woods, who at first is very supportive of apartheid, but in that relationship realises that his opinion, his views, needed to shift and change. I found it a really moving film. And so next week when I got my pocket money again, I went to watch the film a second time. It was a nearly empty cinema by then in the late afternoon. But as I sat through the film, I found my opinions and my viewpoint shifting. In the past couple of weeks, a lot has happened in our world and is happening. And a lot of what we are being seeing, what we are understanding, is actually really important to assess and think and wonder, do we need to change a viewpoint? In this message that I've called People and Family, I want to read from some of the scriptures and think a little bit about, from Corinth in this series called Messy Church, but more widely from scriptures, to catch an insight into the heart and plan of God through Jesus Christ in the power of his spirit, and to help us in some way think biblically and open ourselves up to the wonderful spirit who examines our hearts and thoughts and is able to bring change and transformation. I just want to underline right at the start that the heart of the gospel is Jesus. I mean, that's nothing new, but it's really worthwhile underlining that Jesus and who he is and what he brings is good news. It's imperative that we grasp that, that whenever we encounter Jesus, whenever we draw close to him, whenever Jesus enters into a situation, it is good because he is good, as is the Father. He is the good Father, as is the Holy Spirit. He is the good Holy Spirit. He is holy and loving and in all ways good. His love endures forever. I guess this is a fundamental, foundational, Bible, Sunday School 101, but it's really important that we grasp this again, that the gospel is good news and God is good for all people and for all nations and for you and for me. This news is great and this news is timely. And this is where the rubber hits the road. This is where the, the gospel impacts our world and our thinking, our very lives. And this is the challenge. You see, good news has to be received. When we are called to Jesus Christ, we are called to believe in him, to trust in him. And the Bible uses a word, uh, a very particular word, which is the word repent. It's sometimes seen as a, a religious word, but actually it's a very profound word. Repentance which essentially means to turn around, to change direction, but comes from a Greek word, the word metanoia. Meta meaning big, and noia, which is a word to do with the mind, with thinking. So in other words, repentance is a word about big mind change, big life change, to turn around in understanding who God is, and who we are at the heart of the gospel, that he is good to us and we are called uh, from our life of destruction to turn around and enter into his life. 
but also in who we're called to be. We are saved from and called into a relationship with him, into a new way of living. That happens for us individually, as people, as a person. But actually, the gospel is broad and that this gospel is great news for all people, for persons. And as such, that's where we get family. That's where we get fellowship. That's why the gospel is also great news for community and indeed humanity. We are called out of, through repentance and trust in Jesus Christ, into the family of God, called into the kingdom of God, the purposes of God. So in our series in 1 Corinthians, in this messy church, we've begun to understand that it was a complicated picture. Many things they got right. But Paul was really specific about teaching about this good news about Jesus Christ as the way through many of the challenges that they were facing, including what it meant to bump up with other people from other backgrounds, from other walks of life. Corinth, just a little bit south from, from Athens, was a multi-ethnic, it was a diverse place. It had trade, it was cosmopolitan, cosmo meaning big, polos meaning city. It had peoples from all sorts of places. It would have migrants from economic migrants, political migrants, indeed refugees. There would be trade. People would be living next to each other, bumping into each other's in, into each other in different places, the marketplace, the recreational spaces, the debating places, on the streets, in the neighborhoods. And it's into that context that Paul teaches, Paul speaks and brings good news of the gospel to bear. Remember, he said, the gospel may seem foolish to the world or weakness to the world, but actually is great wisdom and great power. You see, Paul has grasped that in and around Jesus, we are called into a new humanity. We're called to belong to a new family, a new community centered around Jesus Christ. Come, follow me, he says. Each and every one of you, come, leave your old life and enter into the new. That invitation is still true today as it ever was. But that come, follow me is active. Come, follow me into living fullness of life. I've been struck again and again in the past weeks especially around and through the pain and brutality of the death of George Floyd, of just how big an issue this is. Some people have described it as just the tip of the iceberg. As I've been praying and reflecting on Scripture, I've, I've been drawn back to Jesus in myself, in my own attitudes and thoughts, reflecting and thinking, what do I need to change about us, our fellowship, and indeed into this messy world, into a messy church, the powerful gospel of good news. So what do we discover? Well, Scripture is multiple, uh, says multiple, way, in multiple ways, lots of things. Scripture, remember, is, is in some senses multi-ethnic. It's diverse. Right in the beginning of Genesis, we hear of the story of God beginning in the far uh, Middle East. Remember that so much of the Bible's story took place in the confluence of Africa, of Asia, and of Europe. It's very, very diverse. Throughout the pages of Scripture, we are, it's, there's full of stories of people, of different races and ethnicities. This is the story of God, who has made all people in his image and cares for each one of us. No one is left out. And at such, that core belief that we are made in the image of God, that every person has dignity in our humanity, is at the heart of good news. For Jesus comes to rescue us and redeem us and reconcile us and restore all that is broken. 
I'm constantly challenging myself. And we must too, as we read Scripture, that we're not just assuming a cultural lens or, or carrying over a bunch of assumptions, whether they're from our community or our parents or our upbringing, or just by virtue that we've spent most of our lives in Western Europe. So very quickly, an overview. Abraham, the father of faith, was a resident of Ur. Ur being uh, where perhaps uh, Basra now is in southeastern Iraq. Moses' wife, when he married in Midian, she's called Zipporah. In Numbers 12, we're told that she is a Cushite woman, that Abraham's family start to, to challenge him and criticize him. Um, but actually, she's Cushite. That is actually someone from the region of Ethiopia. It's very likely that Moses had married an African woman. Jonah, when he's called by God to, to go and, uh, and preach in Nineveh to the Assyrians, he's horrified by that. Not only because they are violent and a brutal regime, but because they are not his race. They are not his people. And rather than go there, he flees in entirely the opposite direction. And yet God says, I want to give the opportunity that they should repent and come to know me. God's heart is for all nations. With Solomon, the queen of Sheba comes to visit. It's likely that she was seeking after wisdom, seeking after the presence and purposes of God, and recognized in Solomon that was a way to be found. It's likely she came from either Yemen or Ethiopia. In the gospel stories, in the birth of Jesus, the wise men came from the east, possibly from uh, the Babylon Babylonian Empire or the, 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 or the um, remnants of that, that's modern-day Iraq, or perhaps even further, some strands of Christian tradition say they may have come as far as from India or perhaps China. What's the point of that? Well, actually, people from all nations, God's heart for all people, coming to the Messiah, the Savior, Jesus Christ. Way back in the origins and the foundations of God's plans and purposes, as he formed the nation of Israel, was always this purpose, that Israel was be, to be a light, a witness to every other nation. And as such, when we get to Jesus himself, Jesus the good one, the great one, the bringer of good news, we see his interaction with those who are other. At the well in Samaria, where he encountered the woman, she was from a different ethnic background. Historically related, yes, but seen as enemies, seen as uh, hated by the Jewish people. And yet Jesus spent time and spoke and drew faith out of her into himself and their community. In Mark's gospel in, in chapter 15, when Jesus is being crucified, we're told in verse 21, a man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. We, we know Simon, but Cyrene, where is Cyrene? Well, it's, um, it's kind of over towards uh, Libya, Algeria direction, North African When Jesus, in Luke's gospel, is, is encountered by a rich young ruler, the ruler comes to him and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And they have a conversation and they talk about what are the greatest commandments. And the rich young ruler is a devout man. He has kept, his, uh, he's kept the law. He's been kind and good and upright and faithful. And the challenge comes back from Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, you must sell all your possessions and give to the poor. The rich young ruler goes away empty-handed. And then the story continues. That they say, who is my neighbor? Jesus is asked that question and 
in, in, uh, in Luke's story, he then goes on to talk about the parable of the Good Samaritan. I've already mentioned that, and we hear about this man who was uh, overcome by, uh, by bandits on the road from, from Jericho. And two people leave him for dead. But the Samaritan sees him, draws near to him, rescues him, pays for his recovery, cares for him with compassion. Now, of course, we often hear that parable as the parable where we are called to act with compassion towards strangers in the same way as the Good Samaritan did. Absolutely. But at the same time, he was also issuing a challenge, requiring us to receive help as well as to give it, to love those whose unexpected, unexpected, off, unexpected offers of help shake us out of our preconceived prejudices and preconceptions. Implicit in Jesus' reminder of one of the parts of the greatest commandment, we're to love our neighbor as ourself. Who is our neighbor? When Jesus, we had this story read, when Jesus was just before his arrest and his betrayal and his crucifixion, he entered into Jerusalem, the triumphal entry. One of the first things he did in Mark, five, uh, sorry, in Matthew, Matthew 21, verses 12 to 15, is clear the temple. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. What was Jesus doing? Well, it was, it was prophetic and symbolic. But he cleared the temple court that was called the court of the Gentiles. It had become filled with, with the paraphernalia of money change, of, 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 um, of sacrifice, of, of, of the industry of worship. And Jesus comes and says, now that God's plans are extended to the Gentiles, to all nations, to all peoples. He cleared the very area that had become crowded because God's heart was for all people. How did he do it? He did it by protest. He did it because he had to challenge the institution and the ideology that was preventing people from coming to know their true uh, purpose and place in God. That God's love for them and God's uh, worth of them and, and God's rescue of them was being denied by the practices and the culture that had been set up. Protest is, is, is never easy, but it's right and significant. Jesus protested against injustice. He actively did something to clear the way so that good news could come. In our Protestant tradition, the root comes from the word protest against the institution that the Catholic Church had become that had prevented and put barriers in the way of people coming to the fullness of the gospel. Martin Luther King wrote about God's will for his world, but being opposed by three giant triplets of evil. He declared these great obstacles to be racism, militarism and materialism. It's right to protest. In Acts 1.8, Jerusalem 
was the mission field. But Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be clothed with power from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Matthew has this in 28, of you will take the good, make disciples of all nations from all peoples. Acts 8, the Ethiopian eunuch Philip meets. He is someone from the east of Africa. The gospel is spreading to all nations. And in chapter 13 of Acts, Verse 1, we're told, now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger or Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, and so forth. Just worth bearing in mind, there is Cyrene again, but also Simeon, called Niger, a teacher and a prophet. Niger, Niger is Latin for black. Again, in church history, it's worth just having our assumptions challenged. That many of the early church fathers were North African. Some of the pioneers who've helped shape and our understanding of the gospel and what it means to be worshippers have been shaped by people who wouldn't be classed now as Western or white. For instance, Tertullian, living in the second century, born in Carthage, lived for much of his life in Tunisia. Or Oregon, or Oregon, was a theologian who was raised in a Christian home, uh, but he, he was from Alexandria in Egypt. Or Athanasius of Alexandria in the third century. Or even Augustine of, of Hippo, again brought up in um, North Africa. Hippo being kind of uh, towards Algeria, Libya. What am I trying to say? That through the scriptures, through the gospels, and indeed into the New Testament, this evidence, this truth, that God's heart is for every person to bring freedom and life. We have it clearly in the two readings, both from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and uh, Galatians, that speaks there is neither Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. We are all one in Christ. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptised by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one Spirit to drink. So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptised into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. I always find those so powerful that in Paul's summary statements about the gospel, he says we are called into one new family, one new community through Jesus Christ, and that the racial walls, the barriers that would divide and have done for centuries come down. We see it in Corinth. We see it in Ephesus. We see it in the churches in Galatia. We see it through the past in the scripture through the inspiration and the witness of the scriptures and also of who we are to become amazingly profound we're not called as a church to be white and british we're called to be jesus people we're called to be a people centered around jesus christ himself unity in diversity one body made up of many parts not becoming clones and monoculture but bringing it all of who we are redeemed humanity to the glory and wonder and praise of God we get this beautiful picture that we heard read right at the start of our service today and indeed now from Revelation 7 after this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation tribe people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne 
and to the Lamb. Through the gospel, the dividing walls of hostility are brought down. We are one in Christ. These scriptures are powerful and reformative. These scriptures and many others in the Bible speak to this contemporary challenge, this century old, centuries old challenge of racism, of calling us to see in every human being the image of God, a person who Christ died for and who is welcome to join in this great community and family of God. As we reflect upon our news stories and react, not just passively to what we see on the screen or in papers, I pray that this moves actually to who we are and how we respond to people, to the person next door, to the encounter that we meet, to our attitudes. I pray that the Holy Spirit would examine us like a double-edged sword, to bring truth, but also of where our thinking, our assumptions have been skewed by our culture, by our history, by our upbringing, to be renewed, to be conformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ, that we would continue to shine light and bring hope, whoever we are. This is the family of God that we are enriched by our sister and brother from other places. That's the vision of Revelation. Before the very throne of God, every tribe and tongue and nation and nationality around Jesus. It's our history. It's our heritage. And it's our inheritance to come. I want to close by praying a prayer that was penned, written by a, a, an author called Alan Patton. He was a South African writer. He wrote the amazing book, Cry the Beloved Country, and he made a courageous stand against racism. Let's pray. Help me, O oh Lord, to be more loving. Help me, O oh Lord, not to be afraid to love the outcast, the leper, the unmarried pregnant woman, the traitor to the state, the man out of prison. Help me by my love to restore the faith of the disillusioned, the disappointed, the early bereaved, Help me by my love to be the witness of your love. And may I this coming day be able to do some work of peace for you. To Holy Spirit, Spirit of Jesus, who enacts and brings together the plans and purposes of the Father. Where we need to change our thinking, so be it. Where our attitudes have been skewed, in your grace and mercy, transform us. And may we, together with all God's people, celebrate that the kingdom of God is not just of words, but of power. And thank you, for the good news which is touching lives across this planet. In Jesus' name, amen.